Hi, Jim Scudder here. Today on In Grace, we're going to answer this question. Does evolution justify abortion? Stay tuned. Ever since I was a boy, I've been fascinated with God's creation. I'm traveling the planet to tell His story about His world. I'm Jim Scudder, Jr. Come with me on another exciting adventure in grace. Thank you so much for tuning in to In Grace today. I believe you're going to be so blessed as we try to answer this difficult question. Does evolution justify abortion? A lot of people don't even know there's a connection, but there is a very real and sad and dangerous connection between Darwinian evolution and the murder of millions of innocent pre-born babies. This scourge must stop, and we need to educate people as to the root cause of why this is happening and why it's gone on for so long. It even was argued in the U.S. Supreme Court during Roe v. Wade, some erroneous science that we now know is wrong that supports this whole idea that a pre-born baby is nothing but tissue, nothing but a, a development. Uh, it's not really a person. It's not really a life. We know that's not true anymore. So today you're going to really enjoy Dr. Jerry Bergman, my guest. He is a man with multiple degrees, a PhD. He's taught science for 25 years. He's written 20 books and he's written over 800 articles. He knows what he's talking about. And I think you're going to be blessed as we learn more about this connection between Darwinian evolution and abortion. Dr. Bergman, we're so thankful that you're here on In Grace today. It's good to be here. And we are really burdened by this idea that millions of innocent babies have been killed by abortion. That's true, and I'm concerned as well as others. So there's a lot of concern out there for good reason. Very few, though, have made the connection that you have and a few others, and that is abortion has been justified by this whole theory that Darwin came up with. Very true, and especially in the Supreme Court cases, the 1973, the most well-known Supreme Court case, that one of the major justifications they used was Darwin's idea. So the famous case is Roe v. Wade, right? and there was evidence brought in in that case that brought in these ideas of Darwinism or evolution. Explain that. Right, by Dr. Neal, who is a University of Michigan professor, and he argued that at the time abortions normally occur, the embryo is not a human, but it is a fish. And he used the Heckel's idea of ontogeny, recapitulate phylogeny, or the biogenic law, showing that indeed at, during that stage that the organism is not a human, but is a fish. And this was perpetuated by Heckel's drawings. And now we know those drawings are forgeries. And it looks like from his drawings, it looks like indeed at certain stages, humans are a fish or appear to be a fish. But now that we have accurate information about what they actually look like during these stages, we know that there's no stage where they are a fish or even look like a fish. I want to come back to Henkel's drawings because that has perpetuated a lot of this. But going back to the Supreme Court case and that it was groundbreaking really since that day, literally millions and millions of babies have been killed legally uh, by abortion in the United States. But you're saying that someone actually testified before the Supreme Court to that effect, that right. this wasn't a human, this was a fish. Right, and that was a major part, or at least an important part, of the testimony. And of course, what they tried to argue essentially was, we're not killing a human, we're killing something less than a human. Sometimes they use the term tissue, but earlier they used the term fish quite often when they discussed this issue. We have a, a, a person in office here in our district in Illinois uh, that is for U.S. Congress, and and he made the statement as he was running for office in a debate that an abortion, and this is paraphrasing, uh, his name is Sean Caston, uh, abortion is no different than having a gallbladder removed. Yeah, as one other congresswoman said to me that it's just a surgical procedure. So instead of calling it an abortion, it's just a surgical procedure, but of course it's not actually a procedure. You're removing something which is not necessary in most cases, 
and therefore it's abortion. Abortion means abort, which means end. So you, what are you aborting? You're aborting the life. So even the term abortion refers to life, which is stopped at a certain point, so the fetus or embryo can be removed. When you speak on this, you actually talk about the procedure, the abortion itself, and the different ways that it's done. And I think, at least when I heard you speaking to our church, it, it staggered me. And I think it staggered our church because we just kind of say abortion and we kind of say, you know, this is ending a life. But when you hear the details of what that means, go into that for a minute. What exactly happens uh, in these procedures at clinics like Planned Parenthood? There are different techniques. One of the most horrendous is the salt saline solution. They put salty substance in the womb and that salt basically burns the baby and then the baby is killed and then it spontaneously is aborted by the mother since the baby is killed. And there are other techniques as well. There are problems with that, the toxic chemical technique, but there are other techniques as well. One of the more common is the aspiration where they use a vacuum and they basically pull parts of the baby out and then they put them on a table to make sure they have all the parts. Or another way is they use uh, surgical instruments to cut the baby up and pull the legs out first typically and then the abdomen and the final part of course is the head and the head typically has to be uh, cut open and crushed because it's generally too large during this time to go through the womb and the cervix so therefore they remove as much as they can and then they pull the remainder out by this technique and it's just literally pulled out by forceps and then again they have to make sure they have all the parts because if you leave some of the parts in infection could occur bleeding can occur and other problems so they put them all on a table, make sure they're all there. And then if they're all there, then of course the baby is out completely. And then they can continue the process to make sure there's no excess bleeding, et cetera. And then the woman after recovery goes home. As a parent and as a grandparent, and I know you're a parent and a grandparent, this, this just stabs me in the heart when you're going through the details of this, the emotions, because I've seen the birth of a child and, and the beauty of that, the miracle of this life coming into the world and, and the innocence too. This is about as innocent of a human as ever will be. And when you're talking about cutting it up or sailing burning it, or, or even the partial birth abortion, which is even more heinous, it just, it, it hurts me deeply to hear you say these things, but I think we need to be shocked a little yeah. bit about what this is actually happening. Now, can that child feel that pain? There's a lot of debate about when the child can feel pain and uh, the, in medicine, the idea is, is that if you're not sure, then assume it occurs. So if you're not sure at a certain stage, assume that indeed they can feel the pain. And I can see where you're coming from. Many people find it very abhorrent when they realize what abortion is. On the other hand, that's why it's important, at least it was, when we accepted the biogenic law to assume, to conclude that indeed it's not a human, it's a fish or it's a piece of tissue. And so you must dehumanize it in order to perform it without upsetting too many people. And that's, of course, a major goal. That's what Dr. Neal's goal was, is to try to make it appear that indeed this is not a human, this is a fish. In fact, they used to claim there's gills in this organism, there's a tail, etc. Now we know that this is not true, but at this time it was soon to be true and therefore accepted widely. And that was because of this heckle. So go back into his drawings and explain how, you know, what, what he drew and, and what till not that long ago was still in textbooks of the, the embryo uh, compared to a fish and compared to other creatures. Right. What uh, he did was he got pictures of the embryos of various organisms like a fish, a pig, a horse, and so on. And he drew these at each stage up to a certain level. And he was trying to show that development was very similar at first and very different later on. So during the early stages, pigs are also fish, humans are fish, etc. And so he was trying to say basically this evolution in the womb basically repeats or recapitulates the evolution that occurred in life. And this was a strong argument for evolution for decades. And he was, I should mention, Heckel was a really good artist. His pictures are incredible. You can buy books that just contain his illustrations. And he, he certainly had incredible talent to draw. And therefore, it's not a matter of not being a very good artist. It's a matter of he knew what they actually look like and he distorted deliberately in order to convince his readers indeed that this progression, what he called it, occurs. 
And that's why it's so heinous because now we know that he deliberately changed his drawings to make it appear that they were what they're not. And now, of course, what they found out was uh, Richardson, a professor a few years ago, thought, I'm going to repeat these experiments. I'm going to take an embryo of a fish, a pig, a horse, and other animals and photograph them at these various stages. And when he did that, we can see there's major differences between what the actual embryos look like and indeed Heckel's drawings look like. And he admitted basically they were forgeries. He didn't use that term, but he said, well, they're artist conception to convince someone of something, you have to kind of modify drawings slightly so they see your point. And so that's what he did. And of course, that's what uh, resulted in so many textbooks for until recently including these pictures. And, and Heckel was an excellent artist, and that's proven by other drawings that he made that are brilliant, beautiful, exact. So why would these embryos be any different? Well, only to ha convince someone that it's okay, mm -hmm. you know, uh, that th these, are, these are just organisms and it's not, it's not a real human life. Right, and that was his goal. And of course, when he drew things, he, I don't know if he drew scenery, but he drew flowers and he drew uh, small organisms like jellyfish and so on. And to draw jellyfish is not easy. And again, you can go on Amazon, you can buy his books of art because they're so respected and well done even today. And so therefore, it's lack of talent wasn't the problem, clearly. We would love to get some great resources into your hands. And you can only get these products from us here at InGrace. The first one is a walk through Noah's Ark. You get to see the full scale Ark in Kentucky. And we were led on an incredible tour and I'd love to send you that DVD as a thank you for your gift to InGrace. If your gift is over $35, let me send you two more exciting DVDs. One is a walk through the Creation Museum with Ken Ham, and the other is a dinosaur dig with Dr. Carl Ball. I would love to send these to you today, and your gift will help more people hear the truth about our great creator. Now, what do most people think? And I know when you spoke, you were talking about a group of people that was studied and they weren't necessarily pro-life. And, and the question was, when does life begin? Mm -hmm. and, and it's a surprising number of people believe that life begins at conception. Right, studies of even those who are pro-choice, a high percent, 60, 70 percent, depending upon the study, state that life begins at conception. And that generally, historically, has been the, the position that conception, the new life begins. Because once the conception occurs, once the zygote is formed, then it will carry each stage to the birth on its own. So once that first stage starts, it follows its own path and doesn't need any help along the way. So medically and scientifically, uh, you would have to assume that life begins at conception. Right. Okay, just because you really have no other other marker, and if you're always trying to play it safe medically, especially uh, do no harm, then you would just have to say, well, it's when the, the egg is fertilized by the sperm, and that that is a, a life, okay, right. human life. But we, we have the benefit, uh, as a Bible believer, of opening of the Bible and, and finding it right there, that God knows us in the womb. Mm -hmm. And there are, there are Bible verses that talk about there, this is a human, an eternal human soul is, is present at conception. Right. One scripture, there are many, but one that I like is in Jeremiah, which says, Before I formed thee in the belly, I knew thee. And before thou cameth forth out of the womb, I sanctified thee and I ordain thee a prophet unto the nations. And historically, people have known that when the woman is pregnant, she's pregnant with a child. Even if it's in the first month, they don't say, well, it's a fish or it's tissue, it's pregnant with a child. And so that terminology is universal as far as I know. So therefore, once the woman is pregnant, we recognize that as a child. And I know also that it has to deeply affect the woman that's having the abortion too. Yeah, many studies have shown that there are a number of women who are deeply affected by this, especially when they have, a, often this is the first child that's aborted, when they have a second child, they think about this. And so, yeah, it's something that you have to consider. 
although it is difficult to make the choice to abort, it's also difficult to make the choice to keep. Mm -hmm. And this is why many organizations are set up to help the woman make the choice to keep. One of the major ways they do that is to do an ultrasound. Many women, when they look at the ultrasound, they realize that indeed this is a baby, this is a child, this is my baby, and then they're more inclined to change their mind relative to abortion. But there are many ways of taking care of the child and the mother when she chooses to uh, have the child. So there are many organizations set up to do that. But you believe that without Darwin's theory of evolution, we certainly wouldn't have had the arguments at Roe v. Wade. And would we even have this issue today? Uh, it's hard to go back and say, if this happened, something else would be different. But in this case, certainly you can point a lot of these issues we see today, not only the abortion issue, but others that date back to Charles Darwin. And Darwin's whole goal, I should mention, was to murder God. Those are his words. How do you murder God? You destroy the reason people believe in God. Most people, if you ask them why they believe in God, they say because of the natural world, the flowers, the trees, the, the animals, the horses, the life around us. So they believe in God because of the creation. So he realized to murder God, you had to come up with another reason for the creation. And that other reason was evolution. And he tried to explain away God, and he was quite successful because, of course, a high percent of people today accept the evolutionary explanation for the origin of life and the origin of everything else, I should add. Hmm. Well, unfortunately, he did a, he did a great job at uh, getting people to, to move away from this idea, this belief in God. And the Bible actually says that there's no one without excuse because of creation. Mm -hmm. Right. In uh, Romans, I believe, one twenty which is a good scripture to keep in mind. And that's true. And, and Darwin saw that. He, he has a, people don't know, but his only degree he had was in theology. Huh. He went to, was studying to be a pastor and he decided, of course, to change his mind. But we're not sure why he became so angry at God and why he wanted to murder God. Lots of theories, but one theory is his daughter, Anna, died when she was, I think, around 10. And that really upset him. Other reasons as well, but, but nonetheless, we know he was angry at God. And we know that, for example, his whole family went to church, the Episcopalian church at that time, and he refused to go into the church building and he would sit there and or stand there and swear at God, look at the heavens and swear at God. So his anger was such. And again, that's well recognized, but why he became so angry, we don't know. It's hard to say. He had a good life. He was wealthy. He didn't have to work. He had invested money in the stock market. He made a lot of money. And he had a great wife and he had a great family and he was a good family man, there, no doubt about that. But you wonder why he was so angry, but who knows? God is merciful, God is forgiving, but we also have to accept it as sin and accept it as wrong. Until we can do that, we can't correct it. We can't uh, accept God's mercy and grace if we don't think we've done anything wrong. Right, very true. Very well put. Well, I appreciate you and all the research that you do and all the writing. I mean, I don't know how you can do all of the things. I read somewhere that you have 800 different publications, books and things, and it's just astounding to have someone that believes the Bible, believes in creation, and is so well read because you research a lot and uh, such a good writer too. Thank you. Well, thank you. Abortion is such a sad, sad thing because these are the most innocent of all lives. Well, I hope you've learned a little bit more about the connection between evolution and abortion. And I'm so thankful for Dr. Jerry Bergman and his insight today on In Grace. Before we go, maybe you've had an abortion. Uh, maybe there's been some tragedy in your life and, and you're really struggling with that. And let me just tell you this. The Bible tells us that there is a God who loves you no matter what has happened, no matter what we've done, the Lord God Almighty loves us so much. He can't love our sin, and we're all sinners. We're all guilty. But He loves us so much that He said, I'm going to put that sin, your sins, my sins, upon my Son, Jesus. He came. He lived a perfect life. He's the Son of God come into human flesh. And yet He never sinned one time. He died a willing sacrifice for our sins on the cross. He paid for all of our sins, and He's offering you and I a pardon, a pardon from the penalty of sin, a pardon from eternal hell. 
and he's offering it to you as a gift. It's a free gift. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. You can be saved from your sins by simply believing in, trusting in Jesus, who died for you on a cross and poured out his blood. Three days he was in a grave, but the earth could not hold the Son of God, for he rose again and he's alive and he wants to save you. If you'll simply put your trust in him, in him alone, the Bible says you pass from death to life and we are forgiven. And now we can live a life of service to our Lord and help the innocent and help those that are struggling and help speak the truth in love. And hopefully we've been able to do that today here on In Grace. God bless you. And don't forget to join us next time. We would love to get some great resources into your hands. And you can only get these products from us here at In Grace. The first one is a walk through Noah's Ark. You get to see the full scale Ark in Kentucky. And we were led on an incredible tour. And I'd love to send you that DVD as a thank you for your gift to In Grace. If your gift is over $35, let me send you two more exciting DVDs. One is a walk through the Creation Museum with Ken Ham, and the other is a dinosaur dig with Dr. Carl Ball. I would love to send these to you today, and your gift will help more people hear the truth about our great Creator. I'd like to invite you to come on an In Grace adventure to the Grand Canyon. We're gonna be rafting the Colorado River for seven days with an incredible geologist named Andrew Snelling and wonderful astronomer named Danny Faulkner. We're going to film a deserving family having this adventure with us and you can submit an application to get that trip. Go to our website for all the details. Tune in next week as Jim Scudder Jr. is joined by Dr. Jerry Bergman for a special In Grace show entitled Neanderthal, Missing Link. We have us, modern man, and we have the apes, and in essence, nothing really in between. But they need that in between to defend human evolution. The main concern is human evolution. And the fact is, it cannot be documented today when you look carefully at all the literature. Record every single In Grace episode. You will be so blessed as we learn all about God's world and God's Word. In Grace is a viewer-supported ministry. Thank you for your prayers and gifts.